Sup. Did you see that middle thing in the, the intro? What? It the looked thing? like, yeah, it looked like the divider was bleeding through the introduction video. Did anyone else see that or did I just make that up? I don't think I, I saw that. I don't know. I also feel like I'm on like a, a, a second delay. You said something and like it overlapped with the video. So I hope that's not the truth. I think we're okay. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm just posting this on Blue Sky. Oh, look, okay. you have a blue sky name. I, I have one. Yeah, I made one finally, but I, I haven't used it. I think you might be gone, actually. You might have been inactive. I might be gone? Yeah, you're not pulling up when I try to, like, tag you. I made it and everything. I But, like, maybe because you never posted on it, they, like, inactive you? I guess. Well, that'll be an issue that I have to deal with later. <laughs> well, I just posted on Blue Sky. Without tagging you, because I don't, I don't know anymore. I don't know how to social media anymore, man. Nothing matters. I mean, things matter. Just maybe social media matters a little less, or maybe it matters too much. I don't know. I don't know. How was uh? How was your trip to New York? It was good. It was quick. It was. You don't seem that thrilled. No, I'm like, I'm just thinking, like, I got in midnight on Thursday and I was gone by Sunday. Like, I went oh, to wow. Jersey Sunday night. So, like, basically, my, my New York trip was all of fucking th two and a half days. Two and a half oh, days and thought... then two days in Jersey. I thought you were there a lot longer for some reason. Uh, I was going to go Wednesday, but I'm a dumbass and I booked a flight on the same day I had a concert. So, I like, rescheduled yeah. my flight for the next day. Uh, but the concert ruled. That was Baby Metal and Death Clock, which was fucking awesome. And then, okay. no, everything went well at Brooklyn. Good to see the peeps. Good to do, uh, we did our live episode of Survive Forgotten with- Yeah, I saw those pictures. Larry Fessenden, and that was a really cool talk. So we had like, we had an hour and we just packed out the uh, the Nighthawk bar, like the one underneath it. We just packed it out and like, everyone was really cool. Like we were like, oh, how's like a podcast gonna work in a bar? Is everyone gonna be talking and drinking and stuff? And like, everyone was attentive. Nobody, nobody tried side combos or anything. Like everyone's just like honed, locked in. And I was like, all right, that's not bad. That's pretty damn good. I mean, it looked really cool. I wish I could have come and watched oh, Monica. that. Oh, Monica said it ruled. There you go. See? I believe it. I believe it. It ruled. Yeah, it was did very you, good. Did you guys see any movies there? No, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I adore them so much. But, like, everyone was coming up to me like, oh, what are you seeing at the festival? I'm like, absolutely fucking nothing. I'm like, I have just been to how many festivals? I've seen so yeah. many movies. Like, I had my, I've had my badge that said events on it. And I'm like, I'm not doing any movies. Fuck yeah. This. Well, I mean, that was kind of like me at Comic-Con this year. So many people are like, what are you excited to see? I'm like, literally the only thing I did was moderate the Adult Swim panel, and that yeah. was it. Yeah, like, fuck this. Like, I there's so much going on. There's so much. Like, I'm just. I lie. I did one other thing. I did an interview for um, the Strangers trilogy. Oh, nice. With Rennie Harlan? I mean, yeah, with, with Rennie and Courtney, the producer. Unlike. Mm -hmm. They were, I mean, they were convincing because obviously they love what they made and they're they're hopeful mm -hmm. about it. I'm like, I'm on the cusp about the idea. Like some, you, I mean, you know, the general conversation with things like trilogies. It's that, why don't you just make one good movie before you announce or even release a trilogy of films? So I think yeah. I would have had more hope if I had seen one good Strangers reboot. And then I knew two more movies were coming but the way that they described it is that the script they got was almost like one big long story, which... Did they, wait, did they take one script and then build it into a trilogy? And then, yeah, they took one big long script and then chopped it into three movies, which like perhaps that could work. But then also you run the risk of like, well, does that mean the end of movie one and two is going to make me feel less satisfied and incomplete? Yeah. I don't know. They were also like some things were really interesting to me. Like on the one hand, on the one hand, if you're continuing on with the same characters, like you can't have the strangers like stalk them in a house three films in a row. You have to do something different. And they are doing something different. Like it sounds to me like the second two films, they keep the same perspective, but rather than have have a situation where killers like stalk people in a house, it seems the second and the third film will explore 
the repercussions of something like that? Like what happens to someone after the fact? And also yeah. like maybe why killers would do that to begin with, which like part of it sounds interesting. Part of it sounds too explainy. And then it also sounds too different from the traditional strangers model. It's like, this is just me uh, talking in circles. It's me wanting more of the same, but also knowing that if you're going to make a whole trilogy, a whole franchise, you have to do something different with the installment. I, uh. So here's the thing. I like the idea of, you know, like I like the idea of a horror movie that starts when most horror movies end. So in a movie with like a final girl, like mm -hmm. I love the idea of having a movie that starts as the final girl kills the slasher and then what happens after. Like, I, I like that dissection at, at times. So like to me, the idea of having like, like, for example, having the strangers happen. So that's the first movie. And then the next movie being like, OK, but like, let's go from the killer's perspective now. Like, what are they seeing? Like, how yeah. does this look from their perspective? And then you go to the like. But to me, that sounds kind of like behind the mask. Rise of yeah. Murder. Like we had that already. Like we have these these movies out there that do that. So once again, how are you going to make that different? Because little like a reboot of The Strangers to me is interesting because The Strangers itself is so basic. It is a home invasion movie. Like that's what it is. It's good. Don't get me wrong. It's a good home invasion movie. But like I don't know the idea that like you know we have to keep, continue with The Strangers versus like just go make a different home invasion movie to me. Like it's kind of yeah. Like, it's an interesting oh. concept alone in itself. I, I mean, I do really love the idea of like, why are you doing this? Because right. you are home. Like, I, yeah. I think right. that alone warrants more movies and other scenarios, maybe to see how, like one of, one of the things that I, that I asked them, because they did say that the, the first movie mirrors the original, the 2008 original quite closely. And I asked them about the two leads. I, I asked them how their relationship dynamic will impact the story and how they respond to such a home invasion versus the couple in the original film. And, you know, it does sound like we're going to get some differences there, but I do think the idea of seeing how different people having different experiences changes how the events unfold in that scenario. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm into it. I'm going to watch it. Like, yeah. you know, nothing in that, but like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'll definitely, I'll definitely watch it. <laughs> I, I like <laughs> Mongol's comment. Like that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like that's a little Shout bit. Shout out to that one fan who needs the branding to make that decision. I love home invasion movies, but only ones I've heard of. Already. I mean, that's like that, why like that, we get so many reboots. Yeah. That that is what I'm getting at a little bit, though. Like, it, they're, like the strangers to me is just so perfect at what it does. It's bleak. It's it's amazing, but you know, in a way, like all home invasion movies, not all, but most home invasion movies are based around because you were home. Like that's yeah. That well, not really. Bad. Name one other. Name one other where the motive was literally just because you were home, not because like I want to rob you of this or right. or um, I mean, I would look. I mean, I know I like I know like that is a yeah, like I, even something like the purge where someone's yeah. motive might be like it's purge night and you're here. So I'm going to kill you. That's not even the case with the first movie, which is largely a home invasion movie. They go into that house because the guy that they were tracking stumbles into that house. It's a good question. I would have it's to go back. It's like, reason. yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I, I know it exists. I just don't have any off the top of my head. I just know I've seen them where it's like, you know, killers just killing because they kill. Like, yeah. killers I be killing. I expect a very random text message just like in the oh, next percent. year or two where, where it's just a title and nothing else. Random indie horror movies that have done this before. So, do you want to talk about our title topic now? Sure, again. This is a, this is a pretty big topic it might surprise some people because i spoke about this with steve on collider dailies and i don't like this so just in case anybody out there does not know miramax acquired the tv rights to halloween and apparently the plan is to make a halloween tv series that could set up a you know a cinematic universe where they start making tv and film properties within this same world and you know i like it goes it ties to the conversation we were just having about the strangers like like my mentality right now is like, stop it. Like stop being greedy, make one thing and earn my trust and enthusiasm and then announce more. But then also like for the life of me, I can't figure out what a compelling TV series idea could be for Halloween. But then we were texting and you suggested something that sounds kind of interesting to me. Yeah, and to me, because once again, I do agree with you, like in the sense of we just had three Halloween movies, like like David Gordon Green's films did try something. They were 
for, for better and worse, unique, uh, you know, outside the first one, kills and ends really try something different. So to me, you know, the idea of a television show, you have more time. You can build out stories. You can tell arcs that can't fit into a single movie. So like what I was texting Perry about is, I, like, to me, I would actually have loved if kills and ends were elongated enough into, like, a television series to, like, nine episodes. Like, you get nine hour hour long episodes, and all of a sudden, the, the, the breakneck fucking whiplash of going from Halloween to kills to ends which feels insane in a trilogy, which, you know, the movies themselves are under two hours, things of that nature. Um, you can actually build out these stories that you were trying to get to and you didn't have the time to do. So, like, to me, the idea of the town coming together, it's not about Michael Myers, it's about Haddonfield. It's about the people in the town. And it is about, you know, like, that's what Kills was trying to do by bringing back some old faces and saying, like, you know, we're going to have the lineage tie, it's the cameos, all these things. But I think there's way more to tell about the town itself than Michael Myers. So that's that's the story to me. The story is about Haddonfield. I like that idea. Like that idea actually strengthens the concept of a movie yeah. that I didn't think worked very yeah. well. Exactly. I think, so I love that idea again. I think then the question becomes, is, is someone who signs up to watch a Halloween movie expecting something like Michael Myers attacks slash kills regularly? And if so, can you do that for an entire series? Well, you mean you mean a show, right? They sign up for a show. Oh, about that, oh yeah. Did yeah, I say movie? I, yeah, <laughs> I just wanna, yeah, I'm just making sure. My, my yeah. brain always leans in that direction. I mean, th that is fair because, yeah, if you're signing, if you are a Halloween fan, if you are a Michael Myers fan, you want a show that delivers some kind of kill every time. And, like, that's what Chucky is doing. Like, Chucky is trying to I, – I haven't started season three, but through season one and season two, Chucky is trying to tell a story that is serving old lineage, that is serving new faces. So it is trying to tell an episodic. I don't know if it does it extremely well, but it's also trying to do the kills because, again, Child's Play fans, Chucky fans want to see Chucky kill people. So within those episodes, whether they're telling a, you know, story of, about the kids, about Tiff, about uh, Glenn Glenda, like whoever this that episode is based on, you're still getting a kill in there and you're still getting something silly and goofy. So I, I think there is a way to do it. But yeah, it's like, can you really just have a show where it's like every episode Michael Myers is like shows up at the end is like, bah, yeah, like <laughs> Chucky feels different, like because Chucky's a little more playful and leans more comedy, I think it has, you know like the creative room to explore and do those kinds of things and, and, and like play. Whereas Halloween is supposed to be like grounded and terrifying. And, yeah. you know, at a point, if like, even if you have so many killer set pieces, when you add more and more on top of it, they're less scary because like you keep doing it over and over and people keep expecting it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like, you know, I was talking like to somebody about like, you know, slasher kills in general. And it is the thing I'm like, yeah, Michael Myers, like, he just kind of slashes people. Like he, he is the epitome of a slasher because he's just got the knife and he's just mostly oh, doing really? his thing. Like slasher. sometimes. Adam Field slasher. Exactly. But like that, that is the thing. Yes. Chucky is sillier, goofier, toy factories, things of that nature. Eyes popping out of heads. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, on the other side, you know, Michael Myers didn't really do much of that. So like, yeah. You know. Well, I mean, the, the other question then becomes, what, what do you do with a, a TV series like this? that warrants the expansion into a cinematic universe. Like that's the other thing for the life of me. I can't think of a smart idea to warrant that much because obviously like, it has to all involve Michael. Like it has yeah. to all involve Michael or it's not Halloween. I guess the cinematic universe is the weird thing there. I, I agree with what you're saying. Like cinematic universe, I, I it's like, also, I keep saying cinematic universe for clarity. I think a lot of the reports are saying universe because obviously yeah. it's TV and film, but I just keep saying cinematic universe. So does that mean we get like, you know, like a Dr. Loomis spinoff? Like, again, I don't know what characters well, that, are going to do. That's, like, that's what thing. some people are suggesting. And like, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. I don't like, I, that's the other problem. Like, I don't even know what the fuck I would want. <laughs> like I should be excited about the creative possibilities and everything that I've thought of that pertains to Halloween and like still feel because like the other thing I keep thinking about is the Scream TV series. And like I was a big old baby when they announced that, particularly when they released the, the image of the mask and it wasn't Ghostface. Without Ghostface, 
is it Scream? Eventually, that series did grow on me, but I never got rid of the fact that it never fully felt like a Scream series to me. Mongol says Halloween 4 would be a good base. Well, I mean, like, and I guess I am thinking, too, of, like, you know, the fucking Season of the Witches out there. And there's, like, like there are some Halloween kind of, like, ideas that aren't just the straightforward Michael Myers uh, canon, let's say, but, like, but it, that's the that's the thing. Like those all exist as kind of their own sequels in their own un, like worlds in a way. So if you do a television show that is going to build into a connected universe, like you're going to have everything kind of in the same vein of things. Like so, you can't really do a here's Halloween, here's here's three, here's H two O kind of kind of thing. <laughs> I think I like I think what I'm I think what I'm coming coming down to on this minus Chucky is that the iconic slasher film franchises aren't meant for the TV format except for the purge the purge is another good example and the purge was cut off a little a little short but because the purge is a nationwide thing where you could focus on so many different people's experiences and every year it's guaranteed and every year it's different that's something that lends itself to the TV format. But things like Scream, Halloween, I mean, maybe Nightmare on Elm Street. I think Freddy is probably another one who leans a little more playful and also has the opportunity to, to like terrorize more, more victims, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, like we're going to find out with Friday. Like we're, we're getting a Friday the 13th show. So it's like we're getting Mama, we're getting uh, Jason. Yeah, so I don't, like, I don't gonna... really feel about that either. I don't really want that either. <laughs> I, I'm holding my expectations on that one. I kind of am into the idea. I'm kind of into the, how does it all start? Focus on mama more and things of that oh, nature. I'm not. I like, I, I, I think that's a compelling concept. And if it's done right, that is compelling, but. I don't want how it all starts. I mean, not that, not that I still watch American Horror Story anymore because they did lose my patience, but like. The anthology format where it's something different is a little exciting. Like, I don't I don't want a TV series that feels stretched out that explains away the backstory of like the mysterious killers. Well, and that that's a big thing to me too. Uh, and and I feel like to keep these slashers alive and to keep just like any horror franchise, eventually you do have to go backwards to make more content. You have to like show, you know, who who were these people beforehand? How did they get there? Just by virtue of well, we need another movie. Uh, and I think like a good example is the Hell House series. And I just watched the new one last night. Mm. And, like I, I don't think and people were tweeting about it, so I don't think there's really like that much of an embargo on it. So I won't say how I feel about it, but it, it the series itself is working backwards. And basically, like Hell House LLC happened, and like this fourth one is a prequel. This fourth one is kind of like, you know, well, it's not a prequel. I don't know. I don't want to say much more, but. It's giving things that like it's giving explanations that I don't need. Like the mm. clowns in the first one are creepy. We don't need to go into deeper detail about why they're there and their mythos and all these things. And like I don't know. Like to me, you kind of remove like what you just said. You remove some of that mystery by taking the thing that we were afraid of because we don't know why we're afraid of it. We don't know why it's doing what it's doing. And you've just basically backstoried and exposition the fuck out of it and now it's not as scary and like yeah mm -hmm. and i think that's why chucky is doing well because we haven't gone back to get you know charles lee the, the charles lee ray prequel where he's just a serial killer or anything like it's that we haven't really done that like in season one you do get the flashbacks and it's that nature but they're flashbacks so i can deal with that we don't have the prequel movie let's say yeah um, here, I mean, here's another big question with the Halloween series. Would Laurie Strode appear in the series or would it be completely new? You can't have you, her appear. She's done. Yeah. From what you said, I think they want, I think that's the idea. I think the idea of this, based on how you explained it about creating a new universe, is the fact that they want to have that long, that they want legs after Laurie Strode. So you do have to start over with someone new. That's like, those are the biggest genre shoes to fill ever. God help whoever they find to lead that series because those comparisons will be impossible to shoulder. Yeah. I, I still stick on uh, like Spooky Cabins just said like it'd be called Haddonfield and the focus on the town. I think that's it. I, I think that's what it's going to be. That's what I said before. Like I, it has to be the communal story about everyone who lives in the town and a like who knows like maybe it's halloween is like the last episode maybe that's the finale and michael doesn't show up that till until then and it's about this town dealing with the ramifications of a serial killer throughout 
you know, I like <laughs> the idea of like, you know, what if we do a purge show like that isn't a, it's between the purge? Like, what about the cleanup? What about all that other stuff? Like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I just see people losing their patience with that. Oh hell yeah! I I don't argue that part of it. Trust me. Yeah, I I mean really, I have no good ideas. But the best idea I've heard is like your way of getting at it via the members of the town. Yeah. I do not right. know. We shall see. Shall we get to some super chats? Yep, I think we have a few. A few. The Jughead is here. Hello, how are you doing? Evening, Perry and Matt. More live chats, please. We love them. Love and respect from the UK, guys. Respect and love to you as well. Mike Joyce is here. Will Michael Myers have a protege like Corey in the TV series? Here's the pitch for the new series. Like, Corey, Corey's alive, and it's the Corey show. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the passing of the torch. Maybe that legitimately is like the way that you start a new. No, I like I was not a Corey hater. I was not a Halloween ends hater as much as I was a kills hater. Not a hater. Yeah. Hater's a bad word. I shouldn't say something that extreme. But I don't know that. Like maybe if they didn't use that idea for ends, the idea could be. Michael like building like a group of disciples and he's going to take over the world with his little slasher protégés. I mean like isn't that the cult of Thorn in a, Thorn in a way or like yeah, it's not. I mean that's, yeah, fair. So, like, that's fair. I mean like yeah like we well that's the thing though we do have a cult aspect in Halloween already so like that <laughs> is something you could do. How would you how would you turn season of the witch into a series? Now we're I mean I, I am not the writer to tackle that. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I don't know. That's that I is just, the I just really love season Slash of the Witch. Jesus. <laughs> uh, Jughead also uh, gave us a super sticker, which we will look at later because StreamYard does not let us see them. We also have Vincent here. Hey, guys, favorite Dana David Cronenberg movies? I know what my, like, absolute favorite is, but it's obvious. It's so basic. I mean, like, like that's a hard thing. Yeah, like, mine, mine's the, a fly. I'm, I'm not going to get it. Like, yeah, like, but like I really something. do like um, – I watch The Brood. I really do like uh. that. Um, good. But then, like, again, like, Videodrome. Like, yeah. It, like, like it, the it's, well, the classics. Yeah, like, it's all basic. So, like, did I don't Did you like Crimes of like, the Future? I hate, no, I did not like Crimes <laughs> of the Future. I did not. Nope. New Cronenberg is a struggle for me. I didn't not like it, but it was definitely a movie that fell fell in the admire it but did not love it category for me. Baby Cronenberg has taken over. Papa, just let him let him fly. Yeah, I'm history I'm of violence. Happy. Also, history of violence, very good. Yeah, yeah. I'm ha I'm happy for him too. I yeah. like I like uh, baby Cronenberg. Yeah, baby Crones. <laughs> Brandon Cronenberg is very very talented. No. Um, what else did we want to talk about today? Have you? Uh, this is just curiosity. Have you watched any John V yet? No, I meant to write you back and tell you I haven't. Yeah. I have to binge. I have to binge that, dude. I've been too busy. Well, like watching actual things, you know, like that I have to for work. But re-watching The Fall of the House of Usher, like I have a problem, Matt. I can't stop. I still, I, I, um, I only have the finale left. I have oh, to watch it soon. I don't like how, like, why are you here right now and not watching it? I, good question. I'm going to log oh, off right now. Bye. Bye. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, really good. I'm like, like, it's definitely like that true, pure, obsessive quality that it's got where I can't stop watching it over and over again. I have the finale left, but I can still pretty confidently say this is my favorite Flanagan show. And like, yeah. that's all fucking weird. I don't know if I'm ready to say that. I'll like, I'll be an even bigger weirdo and probably have to like binge them all in a row before I can. Also, here's the other thing. I feel like my answer for which is my favorite Flanagan show will likely change depending on like what mood I'm in for the day. Like I, like, I feel like, like, I, I feel like, um, House of Usher has like obviously it's very dark and serious and tackling heavy subject matter, but like like there's something a little like like poppier and almost playful about it. Whereas like like Hill House is gonna like rip my heart into a million yeah. pieces. And then Midnight Mass is for when like I really want like a serious sit down watch versus like Midnight Midnight Club again like serious subject matter. But I don't know yeah. if I want like a like a sweeter young adult story. So I don't know. Maybe they're all even. I, I mean, th like that is not discrediting his other things by any means. If anything, it's it 
to me, like saying follow the house's usher is my favorite is the fact that like, that's just how good it is to, to me. So that is not a comparative fuck the other ones. What a loss for Netflix. How did they, they let him go? How did they? I let don't him know go? if they let him go. I think there's some other things behind. May, I mean, maybe, but like, if I owned a big company, I would give Flanagan all the monies and say, "Stay here, be happy, and make exactly what you want all the time." Yeah, but Flanagan's been very vocal about the fact that he can't like own his product, like own his own yeah. content and stuff like that. So, like, I'm not saying Amazon is gonna, you know, is any better at it, but like, who knows? Like, maybe he was able to strike a deal there or something. I don't know. Maybe that is the case. Um, oh yeah, you were talking about Gen V. So oh, yeah, I, like I, Gen I, v? it was just curiosity. I I'm fucking digging it. I, yeah. I'm having so much fun with it. It is because like some people in the in the chat were just uh talking about if people had seen Gen V and like I love the boys and I was kind of curious to see how that tone, I guess we would say, uh would transition to like Gen V in college and all that stuff. And the mm -hmm. fact that like the first three episodes are probably even more ridiculous maybe is the word like absolutely just graphic violent like horny like it is just everything in the boys amped up to like you know kind of coming of age levels and it's also doing a really good job telling the story of like we have seen glimpses in the boys throughout the seasons of what Com compound v does to children obviously and like you know no spoilers but like in the same sense like we know what compound v is at this point like that is how superheroes are made and like the fact that these parents are signing off on it in a lot of cases. So I really like the arc that is going on right now in Gen V about exactly that. Like you are getting these kids now who are like forced into a college and turned into basically monsters and then them having to be like, you know, wrestle with their identity, but also the fact that like their parents basically sold them out for, you know, compound V and shit. So like, there's a lot of like really weighty material in between the hilarious puppets, like mm. boning and dying. So like, yeah, it, it's it's the voice. It's great. I have um, another set of flights coming up and I already have it downloaded on my iPad. So maybe that's what I'll watch on on my way to and from where I'm going. Such an easy binge. Like some of the episodes are only like 37 minutes. And like mm -hmm. in today's day and age, that is a godsend. Um, I need to watch that on my way back to LA. I, uh, I watched, um, suitable flesh again for tonight. And also not that I needed a rewatch of this, but because we have trick or treat tomorrow night, I had to rewatch that again. I mean, there's a, actually, there's a good, uh, a good, uh, TV adaptation. Like Sam, Sam is another slasher who very easily could sustain a horror yeah. TV series because like, like Sam's great, but Sam doesn't need to be the focus because in a lot of those anthology shorts, like Sam's only the focus for one attack. He's more like uh like in the background for the others. And I think that could be a great through line for a series without ha having to only lean on the slasher and not other characters. Yeah, because you could easily do it an like because you know, Trick or Treat is an anthology. So you turn yeah. that into an anthology show with the through line of Sam and like the through line of the town. And like Sam can be like your little crypt keeper character in a way. And, yeah. Like, just there introducing every every story and stuff like that. Here's a here's a burning question. So, okay, wait. I have two burning questions, and I want the chat to chime in on this. So okay. tonight, tonight for suitable flesh, I was wondering like what I should wear, and like I was testing this out today. Like, but it's not a slasher movie. Should I not wear it because suitable flesh is not a slasher movie, or should I wear it because like it's cool? You, I mean, like number one, wear what you're comfortable in, obviously. But like, yeah. It, it, you, do you have anything like? I'm trying to think I, like I feel like um Rucking Fountain or one of those companies did a reanimator thing recently and I'm like now I'm mad that I didn't buy that. I think oh I have cavity I have a few cavity colors uh really? reanimator stuff. I have reanimator I like the vinyl displaying in my on my case right now. I feel like we're not the same size t-shirt otherwise I would come get one. No. I don't, I don't, well, actually, I don't know. I get small, so, like, it could be. <laughs> this um, is a great answer. <laughs> flesh, obviously. Well, um, so the, the part two, the part two to that is, um, so for tomorrow night, Matt, do you remember what I dressed as for Halloween two years ago? Yeah, don't do that again. You, like, broke out in fucking hives. You're not wrong, but, like, let's say that, <laughs> let's, let's say that didn't happen. Should I do my my Q and A with Mike, dressed as Sam? I mean, without the mask, yes. Or is that fucking weird? <laughs> no, it's hilarious to me. Absolutely not. You should absolutely do it. But also, don't like get hives again or whatever. Like, <laughs> don't have an allergic reaction to the mask. Maybe it's because I'm so far removed from the incident, but I feel like it wasn't the mask. I barely had that mask on all night. 
barely had it on. That's and if you're willing to do that, that is hilarious. Do not okay. get me wrong, but so do, so do it, do it is what you're saying. All right, do it. Yeah. I mean, I might do it. <laughs> like, I think I have to do it now. Actually. Just like cut a little hole out where his mouth is, so you can like maneuver it. So I I think that like I would make my entrances, Sam. But when the conversation starts, I would have to take it off. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank I would have know. to take it off, and I'd put a hat on or something because like then I, I love it. This is how my brain has to work with these types of things. If I put the mask on, the second I take it off, my bangs can't be seen, so I would need no, to have a hat right. on standby. Yeah, you get it. You get it. <laughs> I get it. I'm wearing a hat right now because I have sweaty hat hair. Because you went for a run, right? I did. Yeah. Did I you were outside. Finished. What? You weren't outside. Yeah. What's wrong with you? It's hot as hell out here. I know. I'm. <laughs> I am aware. Don't do. I that. mean, it's fine. I don't know. It's like the the threshold is like seventy five. Don't run. Don't run in heat. I mean, I'd rather run heat. I'm not like a cold runner. I'd rather run in the oh, heat wow. and sweat it out Jeez. versus like be covered in layers and do cold running. When I was training for the marathon and I was getting up to like the really, really high amounts, I would need to finish my runs before the sun came up because I was training during the summer. Otherwise it would get too hot. I was waking up at like 3.30 in the morning and I was on that school track by 4.30. <laughs> fuck you. I no. know. No, like fuck me. I'll no. never do that again ever in my life, but I did it. <laughs> My earliest, I was getting to the gym at like 7.30, but that was because I lived right next door to it and I could walk there. So I'd wake up at like 7.15 and just walk to the yeah. gym at 7.30. Like I am not a, I don't know. I'm obsessed with my bike. Yeah. I, lo I love that bike. So that is like one of the best investments I've ever made in my life. Yeah, that's fair. I, I've looked at those. I, I just don't know. I'm like a biker. I don't know. Like that's just you not think, what I. So you think you think you're not, but when you do the bike, there's like such a wide variety of classes you could take. Like, about Peloton, right? It's a, it Peloton. Is a Peloton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peloton. Like, there, like there's different types of classes. It's not just like sitting on a bike and like biking to nowhere. You know, the only yeah. the only nitpick I have right now is that. Did do you remember the massive seat recall they had? Like yeah. yes. maybe a yeah, year yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. The day they announced it, I put in to get my new seat. Guess what? Still don't have a new seat. So if I fall off my bike, it's their fault. Yeah, you can sue the hell out of them. Well, like, where the fuck is my seat? If, you can sue the hell out of them. I don't know. I don't just know. fall off. So, so basically, just, just yeah. wait until I fall off. I Absolutely. Yeah. Just literally ride <laughs> it until it. you fall off. Literally nothing is worth getting injured and not being able to work out. <laughs> I mean, millions of dollars for, versus the, I don't know, I fell off my bike and I hurt myself for a month. Dude, yeah, when, I, I, when I fell when we hiked, I was like ruined for months. I was so unhappy. I mean, like, I'm still out here running and like freaking. Uh, yeah. I, like, can you, can, you, LA can, drivers. You sue, can you sue every company poisoning this planet and making it too damn hot? Well, number one, but like, no, number two, like LA drivers are terrible. Like well, yeah. at least once a day, like I'm well, very good at paying attention, but like at least once a day, like, yeah, I'm like, you know, like guys just like drift into the crosswalk and I'm just like, I'm watching them and I'm like, what are you doing? And then I made a guy move back once. Cause like, yeah. you know, he, he took up the whole crosswalk on an intersect, a busy intersection. And like, he was an Uber driver and I'm just like, I'm like, move. I'm like, I'm not, no, no. That's, that's a big part of the reason why I got the bike and I stopped running. It was like, roughly a year or two, a year and a half ago. And I was, I, I always run to a school near me and I was crossing a street at a crosswalk, like very yeah. slowly, yeah, very yeah. deliberately looking in the person's windshield, like to like make that communication. And literally the second I stepped in front of the car, they went to the point where like they stopped just in time and the person behind them got out and came over and was like, holy shit. Like yeah. They had so much time to see me before I stepped in the road. It was absurd. But after that, I stopped running outside here. That's fair. I'm just like, I don't know. If you want to hit me, I'll just see you. That's fine. <laughs> okay. We have different approaches to this, but to each their own, to each their own. I'll Do take free have... rent for the rest of my life. <laughs> I mean, that would be nice. Um, especially after the lease I just signed. Do we have any other topics we wanted to talk about? I feel like there were know. other things you sent. I sent a bunch, yeah. Um, I'm looking at your text. Sorry if my text. Oh, gargoyles. What do you think about live action gargoyles, man? All right. I'm excited. But the okay. fact that we still don't have Gary Dauberman's Salem's Lot because everyone says it's not very good makes me nervous that he's at the helm. 
Wait, wait, wait. Say that again. Hey, oh, Salem's just... lot. I well, wait. You're holding Salem's lot against him. From what I heard, it's a goddamn mess. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say I've heard it's great or it's a mess because I yeah. haven't. I don't have any any behind the scenes info on that, but. I am more inclined to believe that the problem with Salem's Lot not coming out is at the studio level. And like, yeah. maybe it is, maybe it isn't a, and again, hypothetical, I'm just like posing a, a potential situation here. Even if it isn't like a hundred percent, maybe they're in a situation where the studio is not giving them the funds to do the necessary reshoots or additional photography or something. That's fair. I would just like I don't to see something else. If it's Atomic Monster working on it, I have a lot of faith. I I do think it's like a really, really damn big swing to make a live action Gargoyle series, though. Give me practical. Give me all, all of the costumes. Do you Give think, me... though? I, oh, God. That's going to be hard, man. I don't know. I think it's one thing if you're focusing on, like, one creature. Yeah. Like, but... how do you... How do you how do you even like photograph a good, because like when you're focused on one creature, you can come up with enough creative angles to make sure that they are, that, that the physical is shown in the best possible way. I feel like that becomes yeah. more difficult when you're doing multiple creatures. I mean, I, it's got to be a tall order. Don't get me wrong. Like I know that's, it's a huge ask, but like, mm. I, I, I don't know. I feel like, as long as they put the right money into it, I guess, is the other thing. Like, because you can do great, obviously. Like, CGI can be amazing with tons of money thrown into it. But also, like, are they going to put tons of money into a live-action Gargoyles adaptation? I don't know. I mean, it is it is for Disney+. Plus. I yeah. mean, the other thing I was thinking is is performance capture. That could potentially be an option. Well, it's, I, yeah. it's gonna If you're doing digital, it's going to have to be performance capture. You would think. I don't know. I don't know. It's a fascinating idea. Um, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt just because something about it sounds delightful to me. I am. I was gargoyles all the way as a kid. So, like, obviously, I was Were you excited. really? Okay. 100%. Yeah. I, I would believe that. I believe that. What were your, uh, what were the favorite cartoons as a kid? If we're talking Saturday morning kind of deals, definitely gargoyles. Um, I fucking, I loved Earthworm Jam. Um mm just going down like the because like of course like the rugrats and all that stuff were there like yeah, all, yeah. All the, all the, I, all I was a nickelodeon there. kid no like start, there was like a godzilla cartoon that i used to love um man like i had to look at those saturday morning special ones i just bumped into somebody with a street sharks toy and it made me so happy oh I, street sharks i fucking love yeah. street sharks that's right that's right <laughs> i hadn't like seen that in god knows how many years and just like all came flooding back I think I mix up like the Saturday morning and the after school kind of cartoons and stuff like that. Cause like, again, like cartoons like Invader Zim were my shit, like a hundred percent, but like uh, that was once again, not like, you know, it was Nickelodeon or whatever. I was very, I was very into like Doug, Rugrats, all wow. the Draco's Modern Life. I loved Ariel Monsters, probably no yeah. surprise there. I loved those characters. I did. You're right. Like thinking back, Ariel Monsters was definitely there. There's something I'd want in a live action TV series. Fucking uh, Beetlejuice, the cartoon. That'd be fun to bring back now that I'm thinking about it. Oh, Iron Monsters? Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Have they ever brought that back? I want to say they did. I think there yeah, was. Yeah, something sounding familiar to me as I say it. Um, I'm trying to think. I could have sworn they brought it back. I wonder if it was like an actual like fresh revamp of the show or maybe it was just bringing back the original. Yeah, I don't think so. Fair. Or at least according to my super quick Wikipedia glance. Oh, no, it, it would pop up pretty quickly if it was there. Hmm. I want more of that. Yeah. I, I mean, but like I was like Pokemon 24-7. So oh. Like, watching Pokemon and that kind of stuff. I didn't watch much Pokemon, but I, I like if I did, I would love it. I was very into the, the Game Boy game, though. Played that a lot. Probably too much. Probably way too much. All right, so we did gargoyles. What else did you send me? Um, Just a lot of stuff. Oh, fucking Netflix. I'm mad. Yeah. I'm mad about all this shit. So a big Netflix story right now is the uh, the the cost hike again. 
there's so many weird things. I'll read the very beginning of the Slash Film article because like, it yeah. points out something that's funny. The iron and Sandy Schaefer wrote this. The, mm -hmm. the irony of uh, Netflix opening physical stores shouldn't be lost on anyone. Video might have killed the radio star, but it was Netflix that was largely responsible for video rental stores, be they small, small uh, mom and pop shops or a part of the nationwide chains like Blockbuster and Hollywood Video going the way of the dinosaur. The streaming giant has also been leading the charge to kill physical media for more than a decade, having only barely shuttered its own DVD rental service back in September. Now in, in an apparent bid to find a viable new source of income, the company is gearing up to launch a series of physical locations that will combine retail and, oh, I'm reading the article, the wrong article, but like, I just find this but funny. Yeah. Um, combine retail and dining with live entertainment based on its exclusive films and TV series in 2025. Like, I'll I'll ask anybody in this world, do you want Netflix to either keep the cost of their service down or spend whatever money they do have opening these physical locations so you can go to them? Well, and, and, well, and you know who wants that. They're also announcing this without a fucking SAG deal yet. Oh, <laughs> and I know. Well, it, that, it, the, all that too. The it's, ickiness of just how how can we make more money for ourselves and not exactly. give it to our fucking hackers? <laughs> Mike said it, but like that is that is true. Yeah, literally, literally, like we're not going to pay the people that they're worth to bring you the content, but we'll charge you more so we make even more. Now we're going to keep more from you and more from the uh, the creators. At what point do you think they open Netflix video rental stores where they just put their own fucking movies back on shelves and turn them into their own mini blockbusters? Because I mean, like. Still can't buy fucking Blu-rays of their shit, but like, you know, these stores I assume are going to be filled with like shirts and anything, any apparel and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, and like the truth of the matter is people are going to buy them. I mean, I know their, their store, their store stuff pops up on my social media all the time. And it's like, yeah. like, it's good. It's good stuff. It's quality stuff. But I, I can't like, especially now more than ever, I won't buy anything from them. Fuck no. I mean, maybe when they when they strike a deal, assuming that deal is is like where everybody wants it to be, like maybe I'll get back. Like even um, like what I'm wearing right now is box lunch, but mm -hmm. you know, especially given the the thing that SAG put out suggesting that its members not dress up as characters from Struck Work for Hot. Like I've been thinking about that ever since the strike started. Like yeah. half my wardrobe is is studio movie wardrobe. And yeah. like, I have, I mean, obviously I have put it on. You could see me wearing some of it at things like Fantastic Fest, but like, I've definitely worn less than I used to. And like the, the other thing, like I haven't posted a picture of a single piece of swag that I've received ever since the strike starts. Like, yeah. why, why? I have many questions about that. Well, I, again, everyone's, Netflix is specifically trying to get everyone excited about Netflix to distract from the fact that they are the problem. Like, that's the thing. Like, hey, we're going to release mm. fucking theme park retail stores. Okay, fucking pay your, I don't, like, I don't know. Pay your writers, pay your actors. It's not hard. This is fair. <laughs> <laughs> we can all just go to the Netflix rental store and steal our fucking copies of Fear Street and everything else. Hi. I can finally own the babysitter on a, on a stolen copy. Yeah. I mean, like, Mike, I get, I, I get it. Like, I get it. And, you know, that, that notice went out to people who are, who are part of the guilds, who are on, currently on strike now. But I don't know. I like to think that, that, you know, us consumers who enjoy this do, uh, you know, do, do, uh, like, bear some of the weight or rather support the, do what we can to support the practices that we want to see used in this industry. Because even if it doesn't affect it, like all this is going to affect us directly, but in terms of like us not being striking members of this guild, even if we're not affected directly in that respect, like ultimately we're, we're all connected. And yeah. I don't know, like in my head at least and how I like to carry myself is that if I don't respect certain things that are being fought for now for other people, like it's going to be my turn eventually. 
So I want to, I want to uphold the same standards for them that I'd like to see upheld for myself. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's the United Workers Front. It's just the idea that like what, what WGA and what SAG are fighting for is, is universal in a way. Like they're just the first, you know, or, you know, one of the first yeah. one ones that are most prominent to, to actually do it. Like the trickle exactly. effect is real. Like we've other, we've seen other industries do it. Like, so I think that that trickle effect is going to keep happening because it, it is a wider problem that is just being brought to prominence through WGA and SAG. Mm, man, do I want that strike to be over. Did there. you uh, did you follow any of the stuff that was going on all this week with um, George Clooney and other actors? Oh, like offering to pay or whatever that was? Yeah. Like, um, I mean, I'd like to believe everything was just done out of, you know, like the goodness of people's hearts and wanting just wanting things to end and having the best intentions. But I don't know, the more I, the more I read about it, the more the more I lean towards the side that by doing that, it's a sign of a lack of solidarity in the home stretch here. Because in in like literally the second I read the proposal, yeah, the first thing that did come to my mind is like, like you're not the ones responsible for putting a Band-Aid on the situation. Like you're trying to do things for your guild that the studios won't, but the studios are responsible for those things. So even if you want to end the strike quicker, you shouldn't be doing those things when they should be. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I So I didn't read the actual proposal. I just saw like obviously the headlines and the things on social media, but like, yeah, if that's how it's reading, like they – what they want to do is they want to they want to lift a cap on dues so that higher paid actors are paying more dues and then using those dues to foot some of the bills that the studios are refusing to pay. Yeah, you're, then you're letting you're letting the studio get away with it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And you're okay. you're you're essentially cleaning up the mess yourself. I mean, I don't know anything about SAG's financial situation, but maybe like later down the line, it makes in some world there, it might make sense to think about these ideas. But Absolutely, right yeah. now, the studios need to take responsibility for what the studio should have been taking responsibility for for years. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, and if you don't get it in ink too, like you know, if that's the thing of like, all right, well, we'll flip the bill and we'll talk about it next, you know, renewal or whatever. It's like, no, like, fuck that. We want, we want, we deserve now. Yeah. And like, yeah, they they gotta they gotta get what they need right now and not budge on it. And hopefully, yeah. they'll get what they need, especially because so. because the WGA. So you know, yeah. WGA did get it. So it's SAG's turn. Yeah. So can I can I pose a, another topic for us? Yeah, let's go for it. You're not going to like this topic. Yeah, I mean, you might like this topic, actually. Well, then, no. what um, I well Caleb usually handles this for us, but I, I do think we have to bring up fantasy football because I think we're playing each other this week. Are we really? <laughs> so right now, you're projected to beat me. Well, but is that the league I have Alvin, Alvin Kamara in? Yes. Okay. So like. He he did, he did well. I mean, I thought the Jaguars were going to do really well for me for a minute, and then all of a sudden – like score got mad close and that made me uncomfortable. They still got me seven points. So I'll take that. So right now I'm projected for 106 points. You're projected for 118, but I have one slot empty because like this bye week just sucks. So it's just a matter of do I get who I want from the waiver wire and could that make all the difference and like put me neck and neck with you? Well, I mean, like why, why haven't you done that already? Because like waivers are over. Like you can you can grab whoever you want. No, I can't. The person, the person that I want, is wavered until six oh, so five. They got, they got dropped. Okay. Yeah, they I got, got dropped. I, I'm like, I am a scavenger, Matt. I wait until everybody does their waiver wires, and then I just like pick up their leftovers, who like wind up serving me quite. There's so many people that that like players in both of our leagues have dropped that I've like swooped in and got. I'm like, why the fuck did you ever drop them? Y'all, y'all, uh, y'all let me have Alvin Kamara real late. And I don't, I don't want to call anyone out, but what uh, I like, I, I picked up some people that I shouldn't have. Oh, I'll, that's I'll, I'll call someone out. So listen, I know nobody wants like two kickers on their lineup, but who is the number one fucking kicker and then drops them? You know what? Now Jake Elliott's mine. So there. That's fair. Touche. Yeah. But again, like, I, so 
I went oh and I started oh and four in your league. Like I, I started real bad, but um I stashed Alvin Kamara because no one picked him up and everyone's like, oh, he's not gonna start for three games. And Kamara has put up like 18 points plus every single game. Matt, I'm doing so bad in both leagues. And like I thought I had halfway decent drafts in both leagues, but then I lost like I lost Chubb, I lost Connor, Herbert was finally bouncing back, I lost him. People Wait, am I playing you in you're playing me in Critic League. Critic League. Got it. Yeah. Now. Okay. I was looking at the wrong league. Yeah. Who do you let's let's bet. Who do you think I'm gonna fill my empty slot with? I actually don't know. I I, I don't want to know because I might go pick them up. <laughs> or you could, or you say someone who I'm not planning on. That's and fair. then <laughs> I could go <laughs> and and get them with like extra. I I, I know what you're fishing. I, I know what you're trying to do here. I ain't telling you shit. <laughs> I'm so manipulative. Get out of here. I've been in this, been in this game for a long right. time. Very. Well, dear God, just let uh, McCaffrey be okay, or I'll be very upset. I have McCaffrey in another league, and I'm in the same position, so yes. Like, they seem kind of positive about him. Yeah. Oh, my God. Spooky, you make me feel so much better about myself right now. I am, um, I'm one in five in one league and two and four in the other league. Yeah, I, I, my dynasty, I am struggling. Oh, I am I, not doing. I'll say this because Monocle's in the live chat right now. I want a dynasty league. Let's make it a dynasty league. I mean, we do ours for ten years and do all these things, but like, yeah, we have to get I want, I want you all shackled to me for a decade. Let's do it. We can do a five year. We can start five and okay, and see, see how that works. Okay, that was crazy. Five. Like, I'm on my second decade in a dynasty league. That's insane. Second decade. Oh, oh you, yeah, this is my shit. You're Sign me up. Also, why is nobody playing Eliminator but me? I think I'm like one of the only people who re-signed up for that. Yeah. Also, I think we, so. There's two super chats. I, I just want to get there's to before two we super off. chats. I got I got Caleb. It, well, so uh, haunted, and then oh Vincent. oh okay, and then this is from the Cronenberg conversation earlier from Vincent Minor, uh, the Fly, Dead Ringers, Dead Zone, Crash, Spider, um, and then Haunted Autumn wants to know. I saw something about Flanagan's next film is uh, Stephen King's Life of Chuck, starring Tom Hiddleston and Mark Hamill. Have you heard anything, Matt? Have you heard anything while I Google? No, I have not been paying attention to any news recently. Um, I've been better about news lately, thanks to Collider yeah. Dailies. Good. But this have, is news clearly I missed. I have been just traveling and festivaling. So it's been about movies, 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 movies. Mm, it's actually from a from a Deadline piece. So oh, this, yeah. is, this is legit. Um, exclusive from Deadline, Tom Hiddleston and Mark Hamill are set to star in new Stephen King adaptation, The Life of Chuck, which will be a hot package at the upcoming Cannes Market. Uh, Dr. Sleep and The Haunting of Hill House Helmer, Mike Flanagan is directing, scripting, and producing for Intrepid Pictures alongside fellow producer Trevor Macy. Nice. I like the sound of this, and that is actually something Stephen King that I have not read, so I guess we all know what my next audiobook is going to be. There you go. I've, Cat I've killer. fallen off with audiobooks. I've loved um, Hamill and uh, fucking Usher is so good. Wait, what? Mark Hamill and uh, Fall. Oh my God. <laughs> you don't even know. Actually, yeah. I, I don't know if this scene happens in seven or eight. He's just got like a really, a really good scene that I like. I mean, I've seen lots of really good scenes, so I'm not sure which yeah. one you're talking about, but like, well, yeah. You'll, like, not, you'll know. Okay. You'll know. Yeah, yeah. This. Um, the Life of Chuck is a life affirming, genre bending story based on Stephen King's novella about three chapters in the life of an ordinary man named Charles Krantz. I can't believe I've nice. never read this. I shall read it soon. Okay, I think we're all caught up on super chats. Yes, I just want to make yes. sure we got there. All, all Flanagan mo um, monologues are always on another level. Rank the Flanagan monologues. <laughs> I mean, there's some good ones. Yeah, um, I, know, I like that. Literally, that's the thing. Piece just go through all Flanagan shows and rank them on a lot. I feel, I feel like it has to be something from Midnight Mass. Yeah, Midnight. The Midnight ones are really good. I, I mean, there's still some in Hill House that are fucking. Like Kate, Kate Siegel has a couple, and or like at least one that I can vividly remember in Midnight Mass. That's pretty damn good. The one where she's talking to Zach Gelford. Yeah, that's exactly. Literally, I was just thinking about that mm. one. They both have some good shit in, in Midnight. You're right. 
There's a there's a lot of good stuff. I don't want to. Um, now right I'm now. starting to think about Usher ones, and I don't want to spoil anything for anyone. All right. Yes. Anything else? Oh, you were frozen. I was like, are you done? All right. No. <laughs> what were you gonna say? No. Uh, what was the last thing you heard me say? I don't know. You just you paused. You paused oh, at, a, at a part where it could be natural to pause. So I'm like, you won't be done now. No, I mean we can be though because I want to go watch my Astro. Game, I know so. it's two o'clock also, hit, hit and o'clock, right? someone someone's got a Q and A to prepare for for tonight. Yeah. I'll just do uh, one last uh, shameless plug. Actually, let me get the uh, the link for you guys. If anybody is in LA and wants to come to the screening tonight, tomorrow, or next week, here is the link for where to buy tickets. Tickets are only five dollars. Five dollars. Five dollars for a good movie, a Q and A, and just like a perfect time for Halloween, spooky season. You know, I mean, come, come on. Do you want to promote anything, Matt? Uh, at Donata Bomb, Twitter, Letterboxd, Instagram, all the social thingies. I've done a lot of writing, so it's all up. <laughs> wow, you sound so enthusiastic about it all. <laughs> I'm so fucking tired. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, like, I'm so dead. I get you. All right. All right. Go enjoy your Astros game. To everybody out there, (laughs) bless you. That's the truth. You are tired, my friend. Have a good weekend, everybody. We will see you next week with a brand new Merry Hour. Goodbye.